In today's episode of Robotics Programming, we are going to give our robots a head. We are going to use a small servo in order to move our ultrasonic sensor so that our robots can better see. We are then going to write code to control the servo movement so we can later synchronize it to use the ultrasonic sensor. We've got a lot to do, so let's get our robots turning heads. The hardware we'll be using today includes an S99G servo. You can get one that is similar, but try to keep it small. You want it to not consume a lot of power and not take up a lot of space. It does not need a lot of torque since it will only be turning an ultrasonic sensor. We also have a small breadboard. This one is two by three centimeter. I have seen some that are even smaller that would work. You're just going to need at least five rows and you're gonna to wanna to have at least four pins, I would say, in each row. I have jumper wires, both male, male, and male, female ends. These are 10 centimeters. I would recommend getting at least 10 centimeters. You can get them a little bigger if you wish. There's a 470 UF capacitor. There's also a male, male pin to connect the servo wire to the breadboard. And finally, the ultrasonic sensor itself, you may already have if you've been following along with the video series. If not, I am using an HC SR04, but you can use any ultrasonic sensor that you want. Our first step is to secure the servo to the robot. Now, this robot doesn't have any mounting points that are really good for the servo, so I'm going to use a little dab of hot glue on the front here and use that to secure it to the circular ring that goes around the robot. Mounting the breadboard will be our next step. Now you could do different things here. You can mount it above the wheel here possibly, but I chose to go in the center of the robot. I just put a dab of hot glue on the top of the buzzer very carefully and also a dab on the bottom right corner. The ultrasonic sensor I'm just going to mount to a servo horn with a little bit of hot glue. There is a part you can buy where you can mount the ultrasonic sensor. It's a plastic piece uh, with some screws and then that mounts to the servo. You can do either one that you like. I like this because it keeps the ultrasonic sensor nice and low, which means that I'm going to be able to see things that are directly in front of the robot a little bit easier. We're going to go ahead and wire up our circuit. On our LCD header, the top left is 5 volt and below it is ground. I'm going to wire that to the breadboard on the left for 5 volt, on the right for ground. Remember, each row on this breadboard will be an individual connected circuit. So I'm going to take our male male uh, wire here. I have a red one, but again, it doesn't matter what color it is. Uh, I'm going to put that into the five volt on the LCD header. Please make sure to verify that you do have it in the correct orientation and against the Polo documentation to make sure you are putting the right place. I'm going to put it now on my breadboard and that entire row now will be able to provide five volts, which is good because we need to split it between the servo and also we need to use it for the ultrasonic sensor. Now for ground, there are many ground points actually on this header here, but I'm going to choose the one right behind the 5 volt and I'm going to connect that to the other side of my breadboard. Now I'm going to wire up the servo. The servo wire has this female connector. Your servo wire may look similar. Please make sure to check the pins on yours. On mine, the brown is ground and the red is 5 volt and the yellow is my signal. So I'm going to line it up so that the brown side is also in the same row as my ground uh, that's going to the LCD header. So now it will share the ground. Now that we have the ground wired for the servo, let's wire power to it. I want to use this power rail that I created on my breadboard over here and bring that over to the power row that is used by the servo. Please make sure that it lines up correctly with your servo's wiring. Last is the signal wire for the servo, so I'm going to plug that into the breadboard where the signal wire for the servo enters, and I'm going to bring that to my pin zero on my LCD header, which is right next to my five volt. Again, please verify this against the Polo documentation. We're going to add our capacitor to the circuit now. It's very important to note the ground stripe here on the side and the shorter leg. The longer leg or the anode on the capacitor is for five volt. It is very important that we orientate it correctly when we put it into the breadboard. So make sure that you follow your five volt lead over to the breadboard. Here is mine in the second row over from the side. 
It's best to make sure that the capacitor sits flush so that it gets a good connection. Now that mine is even, I'm going to put it into the breadboard, making sure that the two leads do not touch. They must be separated. And now we'll insert it into the breadboard, again double checking that we have the ground stripe into the breadboard row where we have ground, and the 5 volt anode into the row where we have 5 volts. Now we will prepare the wiring for the ultrasonic sensor. I'm going to use our female to male jumper wire here connecting the VCC or 5 volt to my red wire. Again, the color does not matter. The black wire here is going to go to ground, which is on the other side. And I like to keep my trigger as the darker wire of the two. Again, colors don't matter. This happens to be a blue one, and I'm going to put that on my trigger. And then the lighter wire, the white one, I'm going to use for my echo. I have the ultrasonic sensor mounted on a servo horn here using some hot glue, and now I'm going to attach it to the servo. The 5 volt VCC lead from the ultrasonic and the ground now get attached to the breadboard. I'm going to take the white wire here, remember that was for the echo, and the blue wire here which was for the trigger, and I'm going to attach them to the same pins we used last time, 17 and 30. So the blue wire goes to 17, which is one over from the right hand side of the LCD header as you're looking at it uh, when the robot is facing forward. And now the white wire is going to go next to it into pin 30, which is on the top right corner. We've completed the wiring now, and we should take a look around, make sure that everything is secure. When we start this up, the motion of the servo is likely to cause some of the wires to move and get jostled, and if there's any tension, they might actually just pull out of the breadboard. So you might want to play with it and rotate the ultrasonic sensor on the servo. This one needs to be adjusted because it's a little bit to one side. Now we have a much more centered ultrasonic sensor. It's definitely a good idea to get the servo's wire, which is a little bit long, back and out of the way. Now that our hardware build is complete, let's go ahead and test our servo. One thing we should look for is to see if the servo library is installed in the Arduino libraries. If you go into Tools and Manage Libraries and search for servo, you will see that there is a servo library here. Now mine is installed. If yours is not, go ahead and do so. Once the library is installed, a great way to test our servo is using an example skit called Sweep that comes with that library. If you go to File and Examples and look under your custom libraries for servo, you should see that there is a knob and a sweep. We're going to go ahead and use Sweep. You're going to have to make a copy of this so that you can change it. Okay, I've created a copy of the sweep skit. Before we start, I want to change the positions of the servo sweep. You can vary yours, but I don't really want mine to go from 0 to 180. I think a better number for what I'm going to do for testing would be 40 to 140. And the main reason for this is that I don't want to be pulling those wires out of the breadboard, and I don't really need those extreme angles. All right, we're going to go ahead and upload it now to test. So first we're going to verify. And let's see what the result looks like. There we go. That looks pretty good. That looks just as we expected. Notice that because we set our limits of 40 and 140 degrees, it is not rotating all the way. I think that looks like a good arc. The wiring looks like it is relatively secure. Uh, it is moving around a little bit, and I think we could do a slightly better job of uh, securing it and making sure that there aren't any problems in the future. But overall, I do think that's pretty good, especially for right now. So we're going to go ahead with this design for the moment and look at our own program to now incorporate more discerning movements. Let's go ahead and create a program that will actually let it utilize the ultrasonic sensor and position it so it can take different measurements at different angles, which will be extremely useful for us as we build our robot that can navigate around all kinds of obstacles. The first thing to note is if you remember as our discussion on our second installment of this series where we learned how an ultrasonic sensor works, we are going to need some amount of time where the servo is stationary so that the ultrasonic sensor can take a reading. In fact, 
we know that that amount of time is about 40 milliseconds, although we also know that if we're not looking for the full four meters of range, we might be able to make that a smaller number. We're going to need our servo to move to particular positions and to pause there. We're also going to want to know what those positions are because these angles are going to become very important to us. It can't just take a measurement at any random angle. We're going to be given these magnitudes different weights based upon the angle. So for example, some object that is straight in front of the robot is going to be more important to the robot than ones that are slightly to the side and they will still be more important than ones that are even further to the sides. Let's take a look at the code that we want to implement to make this happen. So just like we discussed starting in our first video, we have here an include statement for the Polaloo header library. This is going to be here because later we might incorporate things that we're going to use. Right now we're just using the buzzer actually from this library and all that does is play a note at the beginning. But as this video series evolves, I'm going to reincorporate the motors and other pieces uh, that we get low level control from that library. I'm also now including our servo library. This is new and we just installed that when we looked at the sweep function just before. The namespace is also familiar. That's the namespace for our Polu library. And the buzzer again is the one class that we're using from that library at the moment. We now have our servo class here. I'm calling my servo the head servo because that is what its job is just to denote it from any other servos that might be involved on the robot one day. And I have here a switch, which you're going to see I'm going to use later to turn on and off debugging. This is another good programming practice. If we have all kinds of things going on in the serial console, it's going to be hard to figure out what we're looking for. And it gets very chattery in there, especially when things are scrolling by fast. So having the ability to turn on and off different debugging tasks is essential. These lines of code here should look familiar if you've seen the other videos. Just as before, we want to make sure that we're not blocking. If you want to know more about that, make sure to check out the first video where we talk about it in depth. Now we're going to also need some constants here that we're going to use to deal with our head servo position and its pin. The first one is just its pin where we're going to look to send a signal to move the servo. The next one here is the number of positions that we want to use. Now you can change this. I've set it up with seven. You might want to go with three or five or nine or who knows, some other number that you choose. There's going to be good and bad, of course, as to making the number larger. One of the good things is that you're going to have more data points, which is always good. However, the servo is going to take longer to sweep from one side to the other and back, meaning that the robot, if it's moving fast, could be blind to some obstacles. So just like everything else, there is a balance here. Again, this is one of the things we get to play with and find the best solution. I'm just throwing out one that I think is a pretty good start here, but that doesn't mean that there aren't better ones. The last one here is our array that is going to hold the degrees for the head position. So you can see here that I'm looking kind of left to right and I'm starting at 135 degrees and then I'm moving 15 degrees for each one. So 135, 120, 105, 90, which is dead center, 75, 60, and 45. You might want to experiment, by the way, and maybe just set your servo to right to position 90 just to see if it sits dead center and adjust the horn if it's not. Next, we have here some actual data that we're going to use as our program commences. The first one here is, is our head going clockwise? So you'll see that as we change which position it should go to next, one of the things that we're going to decide is if it's time to sweep back in the other direction. So this is going to be used later by our little algorithm that decides where to rotate to next. The second one here is the actual current position of the head. Our setup is pretty straightforward, just like the other videos. I am doing what I need to to attach the pins. We only have the one pin right now for the servo. I have not yet attached the ultrasonic sensor. 
and I'm just going to write it to position 40 as a place to start. I then have a delay of three seconds. Again, I like to do this so the robot doesn't move right away when I hit reset. And I have the buzzer playing a note so that I get an audible noise that tells me I've moved past setup and into my loop. Just like the other videos, my loop again is very straightforward. I'm calling my function where all the action happens. Okay, let's look at our function here. Now, the very first thing that we do, again, if you are unfamiliar with this and would like to learn more, please check out the first video, but we don't want to use delays in Arduino. That is very bad, especially in robotics. So to avoid that, we are using one of the robot's timers to get the milliseconds that have passed since we started it. And when a certain amount of time passes, as defined here in head movement period, we are going to go ahead and run this code. We're going to use this for our servo because we need to allow enough time for our servo to actually move to the position that we request. If we request that it moves 15 degrees, there's going to be some amount of time that has to pass in order for it to do that. Our next lines of code here are going to be our debugging. Note that we again have it wrapped in this head debug boolean, and that will give us a little bit of information in our log so that we can see that we are in fact hitting the positions that we want. This line of code is actually going to request that the servo move to a new location by using the write method on the servo library. Notice that we're using our array here, which has all of the positions that we are going to use and that we are denoting which position we are currently at with the current head position. This means that we simply need to change this current head position index to go to the next or maybe the previous place in the array. Now this code here is how we define what happens next with the current head position. Remember, this array, even though it starts at zero just like every other array and goes to six because we have a length of seven in our case because that's how we set it up, needs to actually go forwards and backwards because we want our servo to go one direction and then the other. So the very first thing that we're doing here is to check which direction we are going. So we're looking to see if the head is moving clockwise. And if it is, then we next check to see if the current head position is greater than or equal to the total number of head positions minus one. The reason why we are doing this minus one is remember that the length of an array is greater than the actual values in the array. Also notice that we are using the write method here above where we change to the next value. We're just saying here, have we reached the end of our clockwise sweep. If we have, change the direction of our sweep. And then we're going to decrement the head position because if we're now moving counterclockwise, we want to actually be decreasing the number of our current head position. If this had not been true and we were still moving clockwise, then all we need to do is increase the current head position. Likewise, if we were not moving clockwise, if our sweep was now going in a counterclockwise direction, we would end up in this part of the code where our limit is actually that our head position has reached the zero element of the array. If that is the case, then we want to again turn back to go clockwise, so we would do so. Clockwise means that we would be adding to our current head position, but assuming that this was not the case and we were still in the middle of our counterclockwise motion, we would simply be decrementing from our head position. The last thing here is that we are going to reset our previous millis. Uh, again, this is because we want to make sure that we only do this at whatever period that we stated for the head movement period, which if we look up here, we have it set to 100 milliseconds. Now, this is just for testing, I'm not saying that 100 milliseconds will be the end result. Again, we're going to have to test this with the ultrasonic sensors and actually make sure that they're getting back good information. That's what's going to dictate how quickly this servo can move. Let's go ahead and fire this up and see how it does. First, we're gonna go ahead and do a verify just to ensure that everything is working well. Let's go ahead and open up our serial monitor so that we have it ready. And let's go ahead and flash the robot. Okay, we're going to upload. And it moved. And there it goes. It's sweeping. Now, notice that 
there's a little bit more of a pause to it because we only have it set to 100 milliseconds. In fact, let's go ahead and change that head movement period just to kind of contrast it. Let's make it 500 and see what happens. So now it should only move every half second and look at how much slower it is. Now this is actually useful because we want to see what position it's actually at. So when it's at the center position there, we want to make sure that it's actually looking center. And if it wasn't, you might have to address the horn on the servo again. All right, let's also go ahead and change our head debug here to be true. Because if we open up our serial monitor here, you'll notice that it is not currently showing any debug information. So we're going to set that to true. We're going to upload that and we're going to bring our serial monitor back. And now when it finishes uploading, we should in fact see the head positions as they move. And there you go. You can see both the head position index and the degrees that it represents. And you can see it move from clockwise to counterclockwise to clockwise. If we go ahead and speed this back up again, there you go. So I think this is good. We're going to have another video very soon where we actually uh, combine this with the ultrasonic sensor because it is going to be a little bit tricky. We have to make sure we give enough time for the servo to complete its movement, reach the position, and then we have to make sure that the ultrasonic sensor only actually sends off the sound once the servo has stopped and then we have to wait long enough for the ultrasonic sensor to receive back the sound and then we can move again. So there's actually a few steps here and it's a lot of coordination that we have to put into play to make it work correctly. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you again in the next Robotics Programming Lab.